On this episode of the Doctrine Matters Podcast, we are going to take a look back at the Asbury Revival. It's been about a year since this thing kicked off, and we're going to look and see if the Asbury Revival is something that went back to the cities and to the nations and all of the countries all over the world that showed up in this one little place in Kentucky, and if this revival truly made an impact one year later. Stay tuned. The Doctrine Matters Podcast starts right now. Welcome to the Doctrine Matters Podcast, a tool to help believers rediscover true biblical doctrine and to help them understand and live out their faith in their homes, in their churches, and in their communities. Thank you for listening to this episode. Let's get right to it. Belly Deo Gloria. Welcome to this episode of the Dr. Matters Podcast, where we are going to examine the Asbury Revival. Now, if some of you don't know what Asbury Revival is or what it was, it was a claimed revival that happened this time last year. So it's been one year since this revival took place, and it happened somewhere between the 8th of February and the 23rd, maybe something like that. I'll, we'll, we'll see some specific dates here in just a minute, but this was a... Uh, a a, a pro professed revival that happened in Wilmore, Kentucky at Asbury University. And, and what essentially happened was they had chapel on a Tuesday, I believe. And there was a, a message. And, and I talked about this sermon or this message that was given at this chapel service uh, at, at least once or twice on the podcast. You can probably go back and listen to that. I'll also link those those episodes in the show notes. And you can go back and listen to what I said then and kind of compare where we're at now one year later. Um, but this chapel service went on and there was a message being preached. And then there was some music that was being uh, sung and people were allowed to stay and worship and sing and pray and do whatever they wanted to. Well, some people stayed a little longer and then some other people started coming in. And then as you're going to hear on a clip that we're going to watch and listen to, there was one student that left, went to class, came back, heard singing and then he and some other friends went to classrooms and, and kind of disrupted the classroom saying revival has started. So uh, that's essentially what happened. And from there, many people from all over the world began to descend on Wilmore, Kentucky. And even people from my own neck of the woods went to Wilmore, Kentucky to experience, quote unquote, experience this revival. And today, one year later, I'm going to just talk about it and we're going to just really get caught up from about an eight minute documentary. And then we're going to talk about it for a few minutes. And then we're going to read some from an article from Samuel C. Um, and we're going to, he, he actually published a blog post about this very thing yesterday, I believe. Uh, but it's something I've been thinking about because we're a year removed and we're going to see if the Asbury revival has really made an impact, but for further catch up, uh, we're going to watch and listen to listen to about an eight minute, 19 second video from uh, Sojourn Films, um, I believe it is. Uh, I can't. Let me just look right here so I can make sure that we're getting it right and give credit. Yeah, Sojourner Films, and this is on YouTube. This was put out 11 months ago, which would have been a month uh, removed, maybe a month after the um, uh, revival took place there in Asbury University in Kentucky. So this is not a new documentary or a new update from Asbury. This was sort of as it was happening, what was going on. And uh, we're just going to watch this real quick and listen to it as it is uh, not very, very long. Uh, but I think it's going to be a good way to catch us up so we can see where we're at now. Any other stories come to mind? Just someone yeah. who's like had this like, huge like revelation change of heart. Of being affected in some way, whether yeah. it's something you know or something you've heard about. Yeah. Can I think for like just a second? Because yeah. there's so many. How this encounter with the Holy Spirit started is um, a group of students didn't want to stop worshiping and then they received the Holy Spirit in honesty and in genuineness and um, they started sharing their testimonies and then it didn't stop. I walked um, into the chapel and saw a bunch of students um, 
worshiping together very um, intimately. It just, everyone was crying, hands were in the air. It was just showcasing the love of God in so many ways that I had kind of forgotten about. And um, I remember I was with a friend and we were standing in the doorway and I turned to him and I said, I don't know what they have, but whatever it is, I want this. Our world is dark and our students aren't hurting and they're, they're lonely, they're angry, they're desperate. And so they've been praying for change. And we've had a lot of great moments on our campus, great chapel services, great speakers, great intentionality, great prayer meetings. And I think after the service on this just regular chapel day, God just started working in their hearts and he's been working in their hearts, but they were obedient to it. You know, when you think about how did this start? Um, it was nothing anybody did. It was nothing Asbury did. It was nothing that Zach Meercreeps did. It was nothing that any student did. Um, you know, I believe that it was just a, like a pure and a deep cry for more of God's spirit that these students had. And look where it's gotten us. And so we have people from all over the world now. I was one of the people who stayed um, immediately after the chapel service. So we had kind of a soft ending. Um, we said people are allowed to continue to worship, um, but I just, I just continue to sit in my seat and pray and just reflect on who God was. Um, went to my 12 o'clock class, and then when I got out of class, I heard the singing, and I said, okay, that's, that's weird. Why is this still continuing? Um, so I went back up, and it, it was surreal. The peace that was in the room uh, was unexplainable. And a couple of buddies and I just went to run around to the different classrooms and barged in on classes and said, revival's happening. There's been a ton of healing from church hurt and from various traumatic events. There's physical healings. There's been calls that cancer's gone. But then beyond that, something that's like I think extremely incredible is I know this campus very well it's small we're less about I guess at a thousand students and I know exactly which people on this campus hate each other and those are the people that I have seen praying together singing together hugging crying like I myself have had a list of least favorite people at this school and I have spent the week with them and it's been like totally life-changing. For some it is freedom for the first time freedom from anxiety freedom from uh, desperation maybe. Uh, for some it's freedom from addiction or whatever that may be and for others it might be a first-time commitment or really a first-time understanding of who God truly is. I mean for some they're just praying for their families that addiction would be broken in the lives of their family members so it is however the Lord is working in their individual hearts. God has a plan of redemption for our world but God works in the lives of people and he can bring healing and he can bring peace in the in the midst of really challenging and difficult things. He's reaching out to a lost and broken people and he's inviting them into his presence and into his peace and into his love and community here on campus and people just can't get enough of it. I feel like the first couple of days I've just felt so much joy like when I'm singing I just can't help but like like my mouth hurts my jaw hurts and just smiling ear to ear um, and just being filled with so much joy. And I've never really liked praying out loud in front of people, but I just felt so like bold in that, like to pray for people and allowing God to use me just to speak through me to people for what they need to hear. I used to have a really big shame about prayer. I used to, um, I never used to want to pray near people, pray out loud. Um, I had a big shame about how I sounded when I prayed. I thought I had to sound like this perfect pastor with these poetic words. That rooted itself in me at a young age and Jesus like just broke that shame of how I felt and like and how I had put my personal image above what Jesus says about me and Jesus says that I'm his son and I'm beloved and that my purpose in this life is to just love him and to praise him. People have been reminded about the goodness of God and that his presence is special, that it's holy. And I think a lot of the transformation has been refocusing on Jesus. And some people have gotten healed and some people have come to Christ, which are things we celebrate. But I think a lot of the times we are just so caught up in our schedules that we forget 
that God is always moving, and I think He's starting to intervene here. I really think that this is just a uh, my generation and all generations just crying out for truth um, in a world that teaches relative truth and that there is no truth. There is absolutely truth. He is truth. Truth. There is truth in His Word, and He's He's answering our prayers. This isn't just going to end and everything's gonna go back to normal. Like this is changing our culture, this is changing our society, this is changing our world. The Holy Spirit's here and it's incredible of what we're all learning. And our younger generation, I'm only 18 years old and I feel like that this opportunity now has created a way of the type of man that I wanna be and the type of person that I wanna to contribute to society. And I feel like that's what's happening, that we're, we're learning all these good lessons and bonding so much with the Holy Spirit that it, this is creating a new wave of all young people that are gonna impact our country and the world. You can experience revival in, in any place. It doesn't have to be in a chapel. It doesn't have to be you know, in church. It's something that you can experience every day in your life. The Holy Spirit is not contained to one place. It's not fake. It's something that's real. And it's truly why we say taste and see that the Lord is good. You can't truly understand it until you actually come and taste and see for yourself. I mean, I've seen like people be healed this week. I've never thought I'd ever see that in my life. Like. We're not worshiping the healing, like that's great. And if God chooses to heal, that's amazing. And it's beautiful and wonderful, but we're worshiping the one who does heal. I think there's gonna be commissioned services where we say, thank you for coming. I'm so glad you experienced and encountered the Holy Spirit. Now go to your family, go to your school, go to your church, go to your community and tell them about it and pray for them. And it's gonna happen there too. So while it will fizzle at Asbury, because it simply must at some point, uh, I think that it will be global for a very, very long time. All right, first of all, I want to say this. I want to say that there were very little things in this Docu documentary that were kind of true and led me to believe that at least there was some inkling of the name of Jesus being said. But a lot of this had to do with the Holy Spirit, which is the third person of the Trinity. We love the Holy Spirit, and we we just probably don't talk enough about the Holy Spirit. But when we do, we either swing the pendulum too far one way or back the other. We don't really give the Holy Spirit the biblical study and attention it, that it needs and requires and really understanding the Holy Spirit. But one thing that I want to point out here, and it's still on the screen if you're watching, is they've they've called this the Asbury outpouring. Now, something I've learned over the years is when you, when you talk about outpourings, you talk about outpourings, it's related to Bethel and Holy Spirit pouring out. And there was actually one section in this documentary where somebody mentioned that they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, if you know anything about the Bible, you know anything about uh, what happened at Pentecost, Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 was when God sent the promised Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, and when people repent of their sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in faith, they then receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit does not come and go. I love what somebody did say in this video is the Holy Spirit isn't just contained to one space. It's just, the Holy Spirit is omnipresent. The Holy Spirit can be in me just like the Holy Spirit can be in you. So you don't go to these revivals or you don't go to something like this and receive the Holy Spirit. If you are a believer, you already have the Holy Spirit living within you. So that in and of itself was an error that I saw. And I'm not, I'm not here to critique the errors in this documentary. I'm not here to critique those things. Uh, I'm simply not interested in doing those things. I just wanted to show you this documentary for uh, some context, a little more background and a little more thinking. But a, a, again, in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost and you, you repent and believe and receive the Holy Spirit uh, you walk in the Spirit, but that doesn't mean that you're getting a refilling of the Holy Spirit or receiving the Holy Spirit again. It just simply means that you're walking in obedience, you're walking in light of the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit then can and will sanctify you. So uh, let's talk about this just briefly before we move on to this article that I read yesterday um, about the Asbury Revival. 
have you heard there at the end that young lady said this is something that is going to go global and it and she said take it back to your families your churches and tell them what's going on now one thing that i didn't hear a lot of is what about christ we need to be preaching the gospel and and and, and i talked about this in one of my episodes a year ago is the gospel wasn't preached at the sermon or the message that sparked the quote unquote revival uh, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ was not preached. A lot of this is, uh, and you hear it in the documentary, there's there's words like church hurt, trauma, uh, relationships being restored, and emotion can do a lot of things. Emotion-driven things can appear to restore many different things, just like emotion can drive people to believe that they're saved, but they truly aren't saved by an emotional response. It's about a supernatural, spiritual response of God changing the hearts of someone and then those people willingly coming to Christ in repentance and faith. So there was a lot of talk about healings, uh, about love, about emotion, about church hurt, trauma again, relationships, things like that. So this was a very emotional driven revival, or as they said in the documentary, or they call it an outpouring. This was very uh, very emotional driven from the front and uh, even to the back from from the beginning to end very emotional driven response that they claimed to be revival and then one young lady in this documentary said that you you, you to taste and see that the lord is good you must come experience and experience him for yourself here at the asbury revival so you for you to taste and see you must experience now for us to taste and see uh, we can taste and see that the Lord is good simply by opening our eyes and looking outside. Romans chapter one teaches us that nobody is without excuse, that his 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 creation has given us reason to believe that there is a God. So we can just look out our windows and see and taste and see that the Lord is good. We don't have to go experience something to know that God is good. When we are saved, we have tasted and seen that the Lord is good because he's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We have had that effectual call on our lives, calling us from this generalized call of the gospel now in its uh, efficacy, changing us to becoming Christian, saved by grace through faith. We are different. We know that the Lord is good. We taste and see that the Lord is good by breathing in and breathing out. That is not a manufactured breath. That is the grace of God that is allowing our bodies to function the way he created it. So we don't have to go to experience it. And I know many people went to experience the Asbury revival. There were many people that said, this is a real move of God. This is something that is going to be long lasting. This is going to be impactful. This is going to impact the world. And what it did seem to do was spark other kind of quote-unquote revivals, if you read or watched to the end there, it said at the time of this production or filming, there were many other spring-ups of this type thing happening all over the world. And we saw this at Auburn University. We saw people being baptized. We saw uh, and heard of other schools that lasted maybe a, a th few, few hours, right, of people just worshiping, lifting their hands, and doing things like that. But the, what is also troubling to me is they claim this to be a revival, but there was a lot of emotion there. And in this documentary, they say there were people showing tangible worship, and they were relating their worship to simply raising their hands or bowing their knees. Worship is really tied to obedience. We worship God when we are obedient to his word. We don't have to raise our hands to show that we're worshiping. So many people raise their hands and don't understand what they're doing. When we raise our hand in worship, it's almost like a sign of surrender, saying that we surrender to you, Father. We need you. We want you. Help us. We worship you. We praise you. And But the biggest thing and idea when we think about worship is obedience. So what has happened since this took place a year ago? Has the world been changed? When we think about world-changing, life-changing things, we can think about Pentecost. We can think about the, the apostles taking their call to preach the word of God and the gospel seriously under heavy persecution, continuing to do so and the church growing. And we even have church as the, the local and, and universal church today as a result of what the apostles did. They did something and they, they changed the world. The Bible calls them world shakers. They're turning the world upside down, things like that. Uh, we can think about the Reformation, the Great Awakenings. We, we can still go back and point to the things that changed the landscape of Christianity for good, right? 
But what about this Asbury revival? What about a year later? Are we seeing our landscape across the world being changed? Because they said this is going to be a global thing and things are going to change as a result. So what, what has changed? Well, I tell you that everything that was going on before the people in my area went to the Asbury revival is still really kind of the same thing. There's, there's, n- there's not been a global spark of, or even a localized spark of revival here in my neck of the woods as a result of somebody going to the Asbury revival, catching fire and coming back and just lighting everybody else on fire with the Holy Spirit because it was a, a tremendous a, a move of God there. But what we do still have is a lot of emotion-driven worship in our churches, in our in our world. And I, and I don't want to sound crude or rude or uh, like I'm coming across as condemning, uh, but but really what we've seen happen at Asbury has really continued to be no different in our world because we still have the same emotion-driven worship services. We still have these uh, very uh, n- non-biblical sermons happening, and, and, and the biblical sermons are, are, are kind of really light and subtle because we don't want to offend people. Um, so really, and we still have the same types of things happening in our world. I mean, abortion is still being, um, not anything done with a lot of people just sit back and, and, and say, well, it's not my circus, not my monkey type thing. Uh, they say they're against abortion, but will do nothing to combat it. Uh, there's poverty, there's homelessness, and there's a lot of things still happening in our world today that, the church is still holed up inside of its four walls. And I would think with something like this, we'd see mass conversions. And that's what a revival typically and historically has done. We've seen mass conversions to Christ. But even in this eight-minute documentary, we only hear the name of Jesus mentioned like once, maybe twice. But we did hear a lot of the Holy Spirit and about outpouring, and we heard a lot about church hurt and trauma and friendships and relationships and all of these things. But there was never much mention of Christ. There was never much mentioned about the gospel of Jesus Christ that has the power to save. We want to be emotion, emotional. We want to see things change, but we don't want to talk about and bow to the one that's going to make the change, and that's Christ Jesus. So I personally have seen no change in anything in the last year as it relates to the Asbury Revival. Now, uh, I just happened to come across this article as well that uh, Samuel C., uh, he wrote it, at least he put it out yesterday, and I think that's how you may say his last name. It's S-E-Y is how you spell it. I followed him on social media for a while, and uh, I believe him to be a great man of God. And he had the same question I had. What happened to the Asbury Revival? So instead of me continuing to give you my thoughts, I'd like to bring his thoughts in here. And then I'd like to ask you your thoughts about it all and to see if you've seen any change in your area as a result of the Asbury Revival that happened last year as well. And then we'll close this thing out. But I want to read this to you. It's not very long at all. And uh, what I can do is I can also... Put this on the screen for those of you that are watching, because I know some like to follow along. Some are just listening, and that's okay as well. Um, But this is Slow to Write by Samuel C. Uh, Again, that's Samuel S-E-Y as his last name. Say, C, uh, however you pronounce it. Uh, And this is his blog post, his article that he wrote concerning the Asbury Revival. So we're going to go through here, and that's him there. If you you see that picture, uh, that's the writer. And I quote, It's been a year since the beginning of the Asbury Revival, and in quotes he puts revival, in Wilmore, Kentucky. Last year, from February 8th to February 24th, up to 70,000 people visited Asbury University's chapel to experience what they called an outpouring, an awakening, or a revival. For two weeks, Many of the tens of thousands of people who visited Asbury responded to the altar calls and witnessed prophecies, speaking in tongues, casting out demons, and faith healing at the chapel. And I did talk a lot about that in my episodes a year ago, talking about the prophecies, the speaking in tongues, casting out demons, faith healing, all those things. Uh, So you can go back. Again, they'll be in the show notes if you'd like to listen and then compare uh, that to the Word of God and what we've seen in in, um, this revival. But let me continue. It was one of the biggest, 
news stories at the time. It received attention from every major news outlet from CNN to Fox News. Conservative political commentators like Ben Shapiro, Tucker Carlson, and Charlie Kirk also talked about it on their shows. What was happening at Asbury immediately became a sign of hope for Christianity and conservatism in America. Therefore, for some, the Asbury revival quickly became the test of the sincerity of some of people's relationship with God. Our revivalist preacher compared the Asbury revival to the Ark of the Covenant. I'm sorry, one revivalist preacher compared the Asbury revival to the Ark of the Covenant. He said, quote, unquote, do not pay attention to armchair quarterbacks writing and critiquing Asbury revival. They're much like Uzzah putting their hand on the Ark. Let God do this and through this moment what he desires and wills. Let me just speak to that really quickly. There was a lot of people, even people in my area, saying that we should not critique this. We should not talk about it. We should not think about it. We should let like God do what he does. Well, the problem with that is, is the Bible tells us, and I harped on this a year ago, that we are to test the spirits. We should test everything against the word of God. And that's what we did. And even I got labeled as um, someone that was just being foolish. I was to quote unquote reformed. Um, actually, I just cared about what's happening in the name of God as I compared it to the word of God. And uh, just if you're wondering, I still stand on everything I said a year ago. Uh, let me get back to this article. Another preacher responding to those expressed caution about the revival said, this revival is revealing the hearts that have lost intimacy with the Lord. When I shared my concerns about Asbury, I received hundreds of comments saying, you sound like a Pharisee questioning Jesus, as did I. The Pharisaic, Pharisaic legalistic mindset is showing up, just like when Jesus showed up and didn't fit their mold. I find this so sad. It reminds me of the religious leaders in Acts. You're a doubting Thomas, and you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Another comment said, I have no doubt God is going to use this move it, movement to change churches and people. Well, I'd like to know who that was to see if he still or he or she still maintains that view. Uh, so a year later, what happened to the Asbury revival? Has God used this revival to change churches? This week, I called churches near Asbury University in Wilmore, Kentucky, asking if they've experienced significant additions to their church membership or major changes in the lives of their church members because of the quote-unquote revival. Every representative of the churches I spoke to said no. Nearly all of the people I spoke to said individuals from their churches visited Asbury Chapel during the revival, but they said they couldn't highlight any lasting outcomes. One representative, representative of a Slavic church said the Russian-Ukraine war has had more noticeable impact on its members than the revival. Wow. Last February, Zach Meerkrabs, the pastor whose sermon apparently started the revival, said no one would know if it was a real, real revival until months later. A year later... It looks like what happened at Asbury was a fad, not a revival. Seemingly, its only lasting impact is that the university had the biggest enrollment in its 133-year history this past September. One media outlet said it was an unprecedented increase of nearly 20%. As I said in my article about Asbury last year, I became a genuine Christian at a fake revival, so I'm not saying it's impossible that God regenerated or sanctified some people at Asbury. However, because of my experiences with fake revivals, I know how damaging they can be, especially to young Christians. One of the reasons why many people attach their hopes to the Asbury revival is that it was countercultural to what we have become accustomed to over the last few years. Unlike every viral event involving Gen Zs, it looked like there were they were worshiping Jesus instead of Black Lives Matter, abortion, LGBT ideology, and other social justice or leftist issues. So. I'm just going to leave it there and uh, not read any more. But I think the general consensus is out. Even with churches in the area of Wilmore, Kentucky, there has been no major changes and really no changes at all as a result of the Asbury revival. Why? Because I believe there was emotionalism. I believe that there was a lot of false worship. I believe that there were a lot of false things that happened there, like uh exorcisms in the aisles. I don't believe that to be biblical. Um, I believe there were a lot of tongues being spoken, and we can argue tongues every day of the week. And I'm still going to tell you that tongues are languages that were used in the early church for people to hear the gospel in their own native language. And God thus built his church based off the gospel going forth in many different languages, which was also a reversal of Babel. 
if you know about the Tower of Babel in, in the book of Genesis. So I'll argue all day long that the gibberish that you hear today is not tongues. And if somebody can show me uh, even a biblical way tongues have worked in the New Testament church, I'm willing to listen. But I think there were a lot of unbiblical things that have happened. I think that there were a lot of people with uh, bad theology that showed up. I think people with bad theology were leading this. It was reported at the time that uh, openly gay people were leading in worship and music and doing things like that. And I think that flies in the face of God's word, and it's a slap in the face to Christ who died on the cross uh, f- to be free from that sort of lifestyle. So uh, I, when Todd Bentley shows up to your revival and says it's an awesome outpouring of God, then there's a problem. And uh, ultimately, we have seen this revival produce nothing in the lives of the local church and nothing in the world. Uh, so this was just a fizzled out thing that happened in the name of God, but absolutely did nothing. So, uh, as Samuel says in his article, could God have worked and used people? Could he have saved people? Absolutely. Could he have sanctified people during this? Absolutely. I mentioned this in the beginning a year ago. God can do things. God can use things like this to draw people to himself. And did he? I'm sure he did. But can we say this was a revival? I would say absolutely not. When the local churches there are not changed, when the local churches here have not changed, when churches in Russia have not changed and say that the war in Ukraine and Russian war has done more for the church there than this quote-unquote revival did that was supposed to go global, that's a problem. So did Asbury experience a revival? I say no. What do you think? I'd love to hear your comments below and love to discuss cordially, of course. You may disagree. I I know people in my area that disagree with me. Maybe they don't now. I don't know. But uh, at the time, they did, and that's okay. Um, I like to be cordial with anyone that has to disagree or wants to disagree. Um, But we're going to give God glory in our agreement and disagreement. Amen. So I'd love to hear what you think about this revival. Was it real? Was it not? Was it all fake? Was it all a bunch of uh, hoopla that really didn't mean much of anything? So those are my thoughts. Nope, not a revival, not an outpouring, not an awakening. Just a bunch of people uh, that uh, put their name on the map and sounds like their enrollment went up 20%. So good on Asbury University for that. Uh, Until then... um, Uh, Well, until next time, I guess I should say. Not until then. I don't know what until then I was going to say. But until next time, keep thinking. Keep thinking biblically. And remember, doctrine really does matter, especially when you attach revival to the end of something. Which makes me think about revival in our world as we know it. Maybe I'll do another episode on revival because I'm willing to bet your church has a fall revival, maybe a summer revival, maybe even a spring revival, and it's all put on a calendar. Can we have revivals that are planned? It's a great question, and I may get into that a little bit on the next episode. But until then, have a good day, and God bless.